And I loved hearing that you have coach, you're a coach that has coaches because it should be like that, right? You never end being a student. And the fact that you have your own coaches, what, what are some of the greatest tips you've gotten from those coaches as you continue your own coaching career? Yeah, uh, I, I, I will talk about Dan Garner, uh, who's a nutrition mentor of mine. And he's the one who always will say, you're only as fit as what you can recover from. And mm. that is a big line that I've taken on. I say it even more than he does because it really resonated with me. It really resonated in the in the place of women being as sensitive as we are powerful because we need to recover even more than men. On average, we need about half an hour more sleep a night just to regulate our systems. We need to be able to produce HGH in a way that's different than guys. We have, you know, more sensitive to stress and anxiety, all those things I talked about. And so that's that's really important. Um, he also gave me a really another big lesson. And this was, you know, this isn't a mentor in a mentorship relationship, but a lesson where I was like I, asking him for more, like, I want more time. I want more handholding. I want more of, you know, X, Y, and Z or whatever I was asking him for in the moment. And he, he wrote me a, a very short and a very sweet, um, brief email. But the, the point of it was the big piece of advice was like the push you need right now is pushing yourself. And I think like, as a coach, you get, and as a, as a professional who's dealing with clients, you know, in this way and patients and stuff, you get this, right. You, we have a moment. It's not necessarily about imposter syndrome. It's about, but I'm going to go do the big next thing in my career, the big scary thing. I'm going to take on this really challenging client. I need you to hold my hand. And sometimes we reach a point where you actually don't need the person to hold your hand. It's just your safety blanket. You've got to take the leap and the net will appear. And I think that that applies to anyone who's listening to this in their in their health journey, right? There are moments you have to have people to support you, mentors and coaches and all of that, doctors, medical professionals, all of those things. You have to have some combine that with some sovereignty and knowing intuitively, because I've had to advocate with medical professionals who have been wrong about a condition with me before. So we have to advocate in our sovereignty. And then we really have to say, is this a moment? that I need to take the leap, that I need to say, I'm nervous about the ice bath. I feel like I've been working out in my house and I'm still intimidated to go to the, this gym or this class, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go and, and, and lean in, right? And push myself because that's something that will, we, we're breaking our own glass ceiling in that moment. We're like, okay, because then you do the scary thing and it's a hard thing, but then you're like, oh, it actually wasn't so hard. Why did mm -hmm. I wait so long and talk myself out of this? So the push you need is pushing yourself is a big thing. Um, I just love Dan. He's, he's a really, he's an amazing nutrition, sports nutritionist, and he's an amazing professional athlete coach. And I learned tons from him um, about female physiology. How I was like, I'm so annoyed. You're this man teaching me about my, my physiology that I don't even know about. Um, so, so he's been one of the most profound leaders that I've worked with. And then Casper's given me quite a bit of expansion in my breathwork practice, confidence and ability to be able to work with all different types of people around the breathwork space. Um, and that includes sort of working with him in ways that I start to understand my own bullshit, my own storytelling, my own, like where I think I'm not good enough, or I don't do this thing, or this is how my life is always going to take a trajectory. And, and he, him sort of using breath in the nervous system more than anything to say, why don't you explore that a little? And having me, you know, really having some big realizations that I think even talk therapy would have taken five more years to conquer. So um, those are a couple of people. Um, and the last person I like to mention, because I've had a lot of male mentors because the biohacking space and the fitness world. Um, but one woman who really changed my life a lot was Emily Fletcher. She's a uh, Ziva meditation is her brand. And she's a really, really beautiful meditation, female leader, you know, in that world who's, who's made meditation approachable. And I don't know if you know her, but her work is, is great. Um, in the sense of sometimes we look at meditation, like, Ooh, it's like, oh, I have to be on the top of a mountain and an ashen field and like half naked. And like, how does that, it's like, we just, we don't need to do any of that. We can just sit and be with our thoughts and we can't stop our thoughts. Just like we can't stop our heart from beating. We can't stop our thoughts from spinning. So let's sit with them and especially in this day and age, right? Like not to be woo adjacent or two in the universe, but we need to be able to meditate on like where the world is going and how we actually really feel. And so, so uh, Emily says all the time, I use this in the ice bath too. We don't meditate. We don't get in the ice to get good at life. We don't meditate to, we don't meditate to get good at meditation or the ice. We meditate to get good at life, right? But these practices we put in these biohacks are not about I'm going to take 65 pills and be the awesomest supplementer. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get good at life. We're trying to 
to un- unpack all of the stuff that we've been we've carried with us thus far ancestrally and in our own bodies and lives and families. Yeah, it's really an amazing thing when people reach out, build a community, and shrine themselves around others that uplift each other. I mm-hmm. found a lot in medicine, and I think this is the big difference. I think between biohacking and medicine, from what I've seen, because I've been to so many medical conferences in the past, growing up around doctors at medical conferences around the world, and then probably in the last five or so years, getting more into the biohacking realm and going to these conferences like the one in Miami we were at, Mm -hmm. um, is that the the community there and support system is much better. Whereas I think in medicine, it's still very, it's still very ego driven, still very me. And, you know, you try and reach out to other people, but then you quickly, you know, go a different route and do it yourself and position as your technique. And I'm not saying that there isn't collaboration. Mm. And there isn't a movement, but a lot of the times in medicine, it is about, you know, you you might know this, you go to one doctor, they say something, another doctor says something else. And suddenly it's a chest bump. It's, it's, you know, oh, you can't listen to them. They don't know this, or they didn't graduate from here. Instead of the two doctors coming together and saying, Hey, I think you got a point. Maybe we could try this or that. No one really communicates like that in medicine. And it's unfortunate. Some of that I've seen, and I've been fortunate enough to not see tons of it, but I think you see that probably you're on the inside track on that. And also, um, you know, there's a really interesting thing about, uh, the way that, that those conversations are happening, like the incentives, let's say like, it's a misincentivization of what to recommend and how to recommend to patients and clients, whether that be getting your name on the paper, the research or like pharmaceutical, or I think there's some weird incentives in there that surely I don't have a peek behind the curtain to see. But it's why it's so important that people like you and exist in the world, people who are more open minded, who are cross cross pollinating with all the biohacking and medicine and, you know, and, and really understanding. And this is why, you know, just like meeting and seeing your work is so I just want to honor that for a second. And, uh, and you know, the way that Freddie, Freddie Kimmel, who's my biohacking bestie here in Austin and who you who, you know, well, is just always, you know, singing your praises because it's like someone he can commune and co- communicate with that feels like, um, cares about what's happening with the people on the planet in a way that it's like, even if you have a moment to go, okay, well, my ego is here. You're like, but it's more important to get this person healthy. Yep. And so like that, that, that I just want to honor that, you know, in your work as well, because that's, that's what this, this gig is all about for us, right? How we get to get people healthy. And so how do we do that in a way that's serving them? Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and Freddie is amazing. I love what you say. We get to do this. Whereas mm-hmm. I think a lot of the medical field sees it the other way. You get to have my you know, treatment plan here. <laughs> and when it, it should be honored that this is uh, an amazing type of field to be in because you're actually helping people live their lives fully if done correctly. And, and it's the same thing with biohack. And that's why I see this bridging the gap of medicine and biohack. And I want it to become that. So many of the things yeah. we apply here for tough conditions are the same things biohackers are applying to optimize their health. In reality, medicine should always be about that. Optimization yeah. of health, preventing disease, living long, living happy. Yeah. And so, that whole picture is so important. Like I, I, I'm i amazed at sometimes the silos that exist. The, the, yeah. the way I had a really bad parasite, I had tripped a trichotrinura, a parasite, an amoeba for two and a half years. People were like, all, I was advocating hard for me because I was like falling over from a level two to a level nine pain in a split second in the hospital. They're giving me morphine, all these things. And it was, I had said to nurses and doctors, I've been to these six countries. I've eaten guinea pig in Peru. Like, are we sure this isn't a thing? And it, I had to navigate all this stuff to finally find this, like coming out of retirement, infectious disease specialist. But I was told gallbladder. I was told, take it out. I was given endoscopy, an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, everything. And, yeah. but no, no right hand was talking to the left hand when it came to my medical team or anyone who I had found, I was dragging the paperwork from one to the next. And I don't, I, I imagine you still see that now. It just, it felt like a very scary time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, I, you know, I hear those stories in the medical community so much. Freddie knows that story is how we connect in so many people. It's unfortunately a trend, but at the same time, it's fortunate because that trend is leading people to something new. And that is integrative medicine. That is biohacking. <clears throat> that's all of these things coming together and really mm-hmm. uplifting people. So yeah, I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm actually really excited as much as that is still going on, that kind of everyone's separated and you're kind of being passed around and what's really happening with me. 
there is a way out of that. And we see that now.